most of my connection with you has been on the visual side where, you know, I receive your artwork and we, you know, we fit around with that in all kinds of different ways. But I'm very conscious of the fact that whenever I'm doing that, you're both an author in the sense of words and writing mm. and also an illustrator. So that, to me, is really fascinating because, you know, what comes first? I mean, does the story, does the writing come first or do the visual kinds of sides of the book that you're working on come first? For, well, for me, it's the, it's the idea which comes first, of course, and, and uh, that's always visual. I always see something in my head, I, I see it, an image, and it can come from so many sources, it's almost you know, impossible to define them, although usually travel is the best way of coming up with a, an idea for me, because you walk down your own street, you don't really see it, because you've seen it a million times. You walk down some other street somewhere else, and you're looking around all the time, and everything's coming at you. And that's when you suddenly go, oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, so what was the rest of the question? <laughs> oh no, that's right. So uh, yeah, so it's visual first of all, the, the idea. Um, and then what I do is I, 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 try and, I try and conceive of some sort of concept that will allow me to realize that desire to, to draw this, this visual thing, whatever it might be. Um, so I'll concoct a project and at a certain and, and start you know developing you know the idea and all the time thinking visually still but at a certain point when i go okay this is really going to be a book i'm definitely going to do it i have to kind of put my desire to draw to one side because i'm scribbling all that time too but i put all that aside and then just concentrate on the story it's not possible i don't think it's possible to uh, to do a whole bunch of pictures and then go no, what's the story? You know, you can't do that. You have to have it set first. So I'll, of, of the two years that it takes to do a book, the first third of that time is spent um, writing, developing layers, which may have occurred to me over many years of pre-thinking about the book, um, getting the text just about perfect uh, in my own mind, and then, and only then, doing the, the artwork and designing it up in detail. Um, of course, because I do both, I can allow a lot of bleed between the two. And once I start the artwork, I can still go back and revisit the text and tweak things or suddenly think, you know, while I'm drawing, oh, that looks much better than I thought of before, so I can go back and rewrite the story to allow me to, to, to show something else that occurs to me visually. So really, that's the value of, for me, being able to, you know, uh, claim ownership of both parts of, of the picture book, the text and the artwork, it's the idea of getting that nice overlap uh, between how, what the story says and what I want to, to illustrate. And that was what was frustrating early on in my career. Uh, I was illustrating for other people's texts and that would be given to me, you know, sacrosanct. You couldn't, you, I, was, I had no rights to change it, but I wanted to. <laughs> and really that's what drove me to, to begin uh, writing in the first place. <laughs> Um, I wish I wish I could just put an overhead up now and show you Graham's studio because it is an amazing place. It's it's something like a mix between you know a five year old's bedroom and you know this you know world famous illustrator. It's just a fantastic place. And you're just talking about that drawing. There's a million ideas in there, all just waiting to happen. Um, but just with this writing, I just want to pursue this just for a moment. You've written. I think almost from the beginning, um, there were a couple of variations maybe, but um, in this kind of rhyming verse, mm. and you're pretty much stuck to that, and that seems to be the form that you're very comfortable working with. Do you want to just talk about that a bit? I mean, why do you why do you write that way and, and, and keep in that style? Because it's easier, basically. It's uh, it's like a safety blanket. Um, if I'm writing text, a verse. There's four lines. I always write with the same basic meter. Now somebody will tell me what that is technically, but I don't know what it's called. Um, some sort of iambic parameter, I dare say. But uh, in those four lines, you know, I I know that this, the story has to be either carried forward in some way, or I have to say something funny, or it's a it's a useless person who gets thrown away, and I do another one. So it gives me sort of like a discipline, a form within which to work. And also it, ta it takes the story in funny directions sometimes because, you know, you do have to find a rhyming word at the end of every second line. And I'm very, very particular about the rhyme. It has to be a real rhyme and the meter has to be absolutely right. Um, I, was, I was just saying just before we started, it's, uh, 
with a book I did, A Sign of the Seahorse, which is very long. Um, the New York Times once did a review of that and they referred to it as relentlessly rhyming verse, which I thought was very appropriate and probably very, very true. Uh, but it's because I don't, uh, I don't fudge it. It really has to be you know, very, very strict as a meter. Anyway, the thing is that uh, suddenly having to have a very limited number of words which are going to work, you, s you suddenly write something and you go, that's quite, that's quite amusing. You know, it wouldn't work if it was in prose, mm. but you can actually get a whimsy and a kind of a wry humour which appears by just a, you know, a, a rhyme where uh, it, it just takes you somewhere different. Yep. Um, so I did a book a few years ago called Truck Dogs. Is it there? No. Um, which, which started off life as a picture book. It was going to be another picture book. And I'd spent a year making it into a picture book, did a whole rhyming verse for it, and spent a year designing the, the artwork, well, the, the roughs at least, and then it was kind of decided by various parties that it would be um, perhaps a little bit too challenging for very young kids. Because although my books generally appeal to upper primary, I think, they do need to um, also, you know, not alienate the lower end of the, of the picture book market. And these things were like these hybrid dog truck things, which I'd sort of pushed together and they looked just a bit weird. And uh, it was sort of like they thought they were going to give little kids nightmares. I think it's rubbish. I think it would be absolutely fine. But, oh, that would have been a good shot. But um, I was persuaded to do it as, as, this is very rambling, I know, but I, I just ramble. I was, I was persuaded to do it as a novel instead. 30,000 words, you know, it was really challenging. I enjoyed the process in the end, but I felt really in deep water, not having that, you know, that sense of just verse within which to work that first thing, you know, like small area. It was like I had this vast canvas, had no idea how to fill it, and uh, in the end it was an enjoyable process, but yeah, that's why verse. Yep. You just reminded me, I was just thinking of uh, Roald Dahl's famous quote where he says he writes for the child within him. Mm. Do, do you conscious of writing for children and for a particular age group, or, or what are you actually thinking about when you're writing and who's going to read that? I do my darndest not to be influenced by what I think kids want or should be reading or, you know, or want. Um, I don't do market research. Um, I, I consider it practically the antithesis of creativity. Um, and also the, the death of the artist. I mean, you have to do stuff for yourself first. It has to mean something to yourself yeah. first, you know. Otherwise, I don't know, it's, it seems all a bit sort of hollow. Um, I mean, maybe I'm just saying that from a very, you know, a point of, of the luxury of doing what I love and actually having it sell. You know, things I'd be doing it anyway, and I might be doing it as a hobby if, if I wasn't lucky enough that what I do naturally has a has a commercial outlet. The old Dahl quote of the child within is exactly right. It's how I feel. I really feel, you know, still, you know, as though I've carried my childhood along with me through life, and I, you know, I think that's a, a thing to be treasured if if it, if it happens. And the job which I've got tends to perpetuate that that sense. Um, but it's, it's more a sense that if I just play straight, straight back, I'm not going to alienate any kids. I mean, they might not understand some, some of the more esoteric or, or more sophisticated levels, and all the books have layers and levels, but they also have, that's cute, <laughs> they, also, they also have entry points, um, so that I'm aware that if I, if I you know, uh, use sort of words which are maybe a little bit sort of tough in one place, I'll make sure that the artwork explains it, you know. Um, so I don't talk down to kids and therefore I'm, not, I'm never going to, you know, suffer that failure and going, get out of it, you know, and, and walking. That's what, that's what happens, I think, if you talk down to kids and I can't bear that idea. Um, I'd always rather aim above their heads and they'll rise to the occasion. So for me, I don't target my books to any particular group. I know the publishers have to, but that's their job. To some extent, we have a you know a mutual direction, but in that in that regard, my job, as I see it, is to do what I believe in, and the publisher's job is to, to pursue it <laughs> in whatever direction they need to do, to make a you know, commercial product from it. Yeah. Is that too harsh? No, no. <laughs> I, I see illustration as, as perhaps in two different extremes. One is drawing. Yep. How an option read that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and the other end is design, where you might find someone like Deborah Nardin working. Where do you feel you fit within that that context? Nowhere near either, actually. Um, I certainly, I mean, I went through college and did a design course, um, and whilst it didn't teach me 
much at all about, you know, illustrating, I don't think, not a lot anyway. It did teach me a lot about spatial dynamics, you know, how things sit on the page, and, and practical things like typography, uh, kerning, you know, methods of print reproduction and stuff, all of which stood me in a really good stead, but I kind of made this, this style up as I went along. Um, it's, it's nominally watercolour, and it is very linear. It's become less linear, actually. This might be more closer to an answer to what you were getting at, but my early work was it almost exclusively in black and white. I had no idea of colour at all. Uh, when I was at school and through high school, everything I did was with, you know, those, ro those rotring, repeated, you know, fine pens? Loved those things to death. Got a big set of them, about eight of them or something, from the finest, finest things, which always used to clog up, you know, just used to drive you mad. But I would do this really, really fine black and white work, um, and as I say, tremendously linear. My heroes were Escher and um, uh, Albert Dürer, you know, that kind of amazing design, black and white work. Um, and it was only much later that I started you know, being forced to use colour. In my very first book, my grandma lived in Gulli Gulch. Uh, half the pages uh, were done as line work, black and white line work, printed sepia. Uh, because, I mean, I would have done the whole book in black and white if they'd let me. But I was convinced that I had to learn, I had to do colour, you know. And it's, it's very tentative. And with Animalia, the, uh, the, the, the pictures there, it's colour all, all throughout, but all the colours are sort of held away from each other by, by line work, you know, I would draw everything really carefully with a pencil, then, then sort of draw it with, with, with you know, ink, and then colour it in, so security. Whereas if you look at the work now, um, the lines have almost disappeared, and I, I let the colours touch. <laughs> so it's, yeah, just like that. So uh, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, for me, looser. I mean, it's, got, it's not loose by anyone else's standards, I realise that. So, yeah, the work, I think it's still, you know, tremendously uh, linear. Um, there's nothing really terribly painfully about what I did because I, that's the only way I, I learned how to do it. I sort of grew from those beginnings. The element of decoration, and I was looking at quite a bit of your work recently, is really, really huge. You know, I mean, so much decoration that gets into the, you know, floral patterns and stuff like that. The bits of Art Nouveau kind of mm. work around the borders of Enigma and around the type and that kind of thing. Where do you go to get all of that, or is that just all in, all in there from years of doing doing this? Oh, it's 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 a it's a desire. Yes, it is a desire to decorate um, and to embellish things. Um, it could also be described as never knowing when to stop. I mean, I, I, I yeah, you're laughing at that. I, I, I just, I, I'd, I'd love to be able to do those really broad, you know, sweeping kind of pictures with nothing going on, but just, just one thing. Or there's a guy, Frank Frazetta, who does sort of a lot of fantasy out here, and, and he's fantastic because he's able just to sort of put a terrific amount of detail into one part, and it just goes off into almost brush strokes. It's so casual. But it draws your eye, magnificent, astonishing technique. But I have to, I have to do detail all the way to the corners, every every given corner. Um, so actually, I, I I I wonder whether you know, a development for me might be to stop doing that and and to actually just relax a bit and allow some bits to be you know, a bit more un, unfinished. I could do more books. So it wouldn't take as long if I just didn't do all the detail. Um, in particular, I love the art and crafts move, movement, though. That that's the for me, almost the pinnacle of decoration and decorative decorative arts would be William Morris yeah. and, and that period. I love yeah. that to death. Yeah. yeah. Can we just talk a little bit about the technical stuff? Because there might be some people here that are interested in that. Now, the kinds of papers you're using and um, inks, watercolour, and uh, that sort of stuff that you're, you're working with. Can you talk just a little bit about that and just give us a little bit of detail? Oh, look, I'm, I'm not terribly technically au fait with it all, to tell you the truth. I, I sort of find paper at the, at the shop that seems to do the job. Um, it's not Fabriano watercolour paper. It tends to be hot press illustration paper. I started off doing it all on hot press illustration board, and the publishers hate this because it means you've got to, it, it, you can't wrap it around a scanning drum. You know, you, 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 the drum spins, you, yeah, man, you, whatever. Um, and it means you have to take a transparency, a huge big you know, slide of, of, of the work and then wrap that around the drum so that you can scan it. And it just means one more generation away from the original artwork. But I needed to work on board in those early days. Everything, Animalia, 11th Hour Seahorse, Earth Dragons, they were all just done on this, on this board and, and photographed. Because I was scared of sort of like scrunching the paper. You know, I, 
<laughs> That's a bit of a worry, isn't it? But I, you know, I needed the hard surface to work on. But I was convinced to give it a go at some point, and I found it's not so bad. I didn't scratch the paper after all, and I didn't go through it and sort of tear it as I was I was afraid of. The um, <laughs> that's right. At least it wasn't me. I turned mine up. Um, the 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 technique is uh, was originally watercolor uh, with, as I say, those those ink pens, rot rotary ink pens, um, and and quite a lot of airbrush. In fact, when I first discovered the airbrush at college, I thought this was like you know God's gift to illustrators. <laughs> Whoa, look at this! And after a while, I thought, why does my stuff all look plasticky? You know, my artwork. So I started using the airbrush a little less and brushes a little more. I don't use watercolor so much now as um, these lovely acrylic transparent inks. And they're fantastic. They sort of work the same way as watercolor. Sit on the page a little longer, actually, a little bit more forgiving. And the colors are just that much more vivid, really brilliant colors. And then over the top of that, I overlay uh, colored pencils. And Biro. All points, fantastic. Kids go, you're kidding me? No, seriously, colored pencil and biro. Because with the biro, you can get a really, really hard, solid line if you press hard, and if you press lightly, it's the faint, you know, most softest line in the world. Great for doing sort of fur, and, and also for slightly keeping the colors apart. <laughs> Just very, very subtly. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know how it's gonna sort of go in 100 years time, maybe the, 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 the papers are gonna just sort of you know, dissolve away because of all the acid, I've got no idea. But my experience is that if you sort of get it on your face or a t-shirt, it never comes off. So I think it's probably fairly safe. Um, it seems to be a little less these days to me, but um, there always are people who want to aspire to be illustrators, both very young and, you know, people who have uh, spent a uh, few years doing other things as well. If you're going to give advice to anyone who wanted to become an illustrator today, what would the advice be? Start 25 years ago. I was so lucky. I was so lucky. When I, when I, um, when I got ejected from the advertising industry, and I was ejected, believe me, I, I, I went through uh, three jobs in, um, in 18 months, uh, fresh out of college. And I was just having a terrible time of it. I hated it, and they hated me. And I, loved, I, I got fired from the third one um, for incompetence. <laughs> no, I know, it sounds funny, but it's true. Because I was just hating my work. I was hating what I was doing, and it just, I was doing rubbish. Um, also, it was also the pressure was killing me. I remember doing, doing uh, super artwork, you know, in inverted commas, and there was a taxi driver sitting in the lobby, flipping through magazines with the, with the meter running downstairs, you know, while I'm trying to draw something to, to, to deliver to the client. So I, anyway, that didn't last. Um, and what was I saying there? Advice, I keep on doing this. To Sorry, yeah, that's right, advice, yeah, he's, he's, he's prompting me. <laughs> um, well, I, I was going somewhere with it, but I've almost forgotten where it was. It's been a long day. Um, so yeah, so that's right. So then I got this, this job in advertising, uh, so in, in publishing, and, I, and I, I, I didn't even get a rejection slip. I mean, I just came up with this idea for a book and took it to the people who I've been doing book jackets for. And uh, this fellow called Bob Sessions who was working for Thomas Nelson at the time. And I had this, this poem from my grandma lived in Gouli Gulch and half a dozen illustrations. And he just took it and uh, he, he rang back about, you know, a week later and said, yeah, we will publish this. You know, it was that easy. Um, but now I know how hard it is. People on, on just about every, every book signing, which I've just been five weeks around America, there's always somebody who asks me, I'm trying to get into the business, what do I do? And I feel, I feel powerless to, to, to really help because I know now you need to get, look, yeah, at least in America, you have to have an agent. And, and publishers won't take unsolicited work. You, you, you could almost answer this better than me, uh, Tony, about you know, what, what publishers will and will not accept. Um, in the end, I don't know, I think probably the most important thing is just to need to do it, to do it for yourself first. Because then, you know, if you don't get published, well, you know, you've got that. You haven't just wasted your time. It's meant something to you. And I suspect that'll shine through, too. Um, I'm, I'm torn between being sort of pragmatic and saying, you know, go to bookstores and find out who's publishing what and, you know, whether this publisher's going to like what you do, but my heart tells me it's the opposite. Just do what you love and, you know, and somehow it'll work out. It sounds a bit kind of airy-fairy, doesn't it? But that was my experience. I, I, 
There's no way when I did Animalia, let me put it this way, that, that I expected or thought that the world needed another English language alphabet book, for goodness sake. You know, that, that wasn't like the game plan. I think if I thought about it for 15 seconds, I wouldn't have done the book. Um, or if I'd done the research, you would have said, no, the world does not need another book like that, and I wouldn't have done it. But I just did it as a, just an outflowing of creativity, and I was just maybe incredibly lucky. This, this will sound a bit trite, but I'll sort of try it on. Um, it's, I, 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 I've sort of just developed this, 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 this theory of the three P's. The first of them is passion, because I tell kids this. So pardon me if I'm sort of talking to the wrong audience, but passion is incredibly important. Um, because it, it's, it's what drives you to do it in the first place and what's, what makes you keep doing it and getting good at it because you just have to do it, you love it. Perspiration or perhaps persistence would be the next P. Um, you just, you know, the, the going gets hard, you just got to hang in there, work hard because you've got to follow up that passion with actual work. <laughs> and in the end, the other one is providence. Which, which I don't mean in the spiritual sense, but I mean luck. You, you've honestly just got to have luck as well. And I've had a bucket load. I've just somehow met the right people at the right time, been in the right place, occasionally had the right idea, especially Animalia, just made me into a book that changed my life. Um, and I'm afraid you need that too. And you know, so there isn't really much of a sort of a, a roadmap, is it, to, to get anywhere, but most important, you know, it starts with passion. You just got to, you're going to need to do this. You, uh, you, nobody gets into the book illustration business because they think they're going to make a pile of money out of it. They, they, they get into it because they, they just, they just need to. They love the idea of creating things. Yeah. I think we need to finish up. So can we just give him a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you very much.